So given your long private sector work history, how does someone of your pedigree end up being Dean of Engineering at a technical college? What brought you here? Yeah, that's a little bit odd. I had the uh, opportunity of working with the college system most of my career in some shape or form, helping organizations develop the talent that they need when I was in maintenance and operations and then uh, in training and development. And so uh, I've had a long-standing relationship, not only with Mohawk College, but other institutions uh, across the country as I traveled and even in Europe and the US. And so those institutions allow you the opportunity to actually you know, help you solve your problems, skill build your employees, maintain you know, the competence that you need to actually run your processes. I was also fortunate to work for organizations that valued that, and that was very, very important. And you know, if I look back uh, here in Hamilton, companies like DeFasco that have been around 106 years and have maintained profitability and are actually helping the larger group around the world, it's a core competence they have in terms of the ability to skill build. But they didn't do it alone. They did it with partners in education. And even when I went out west, it was the same thing out there. Companies like Suncor that, you know, have maintained a strong position uh, because they have competence in their employees. So. Colleges serve that role very, very well, and their roles expanded over the last few years in that they've gotten into other things that you wouldn't think about uh, them doing, like uh, research and development, and so they play a different role in that. They like to solve uh, problems, uh, short-term problems, not long-term uh, you know, research activities like maybe a university would do, where that brings a different level of skill set. College is now helping, they go into the field, they work with companies, and so that appealed to me and uh, I happened to be in a position in my career where I was you know looking for a soft landing uh, they wanted to build this uh, new the Joyce Center which is the Canada's largest net zero uh, building and geothermal and solar and uh, they asked me to take a look at it and see what I could put inside of it and so from that came the opportunity to put in uh, some of the emerging technologies and these labs are all uh, helping us deal with uh, advanced manufacturing and uh, there again in this community and and even across Ontario and hopefully in the aerospace business really make Canada competitive and we're going to play a big role in that. I'm uh, curious as to how your long history in industry has helped you uh, be the leader of an academic faculty at a college. What skills and experience have, have you had to translate or use in this current world. Yeah, I might be a bit of an anomaly. I don't know that I'm the traditional dean, but I think I bring a different perspective into how I would look at things. And so I bring that uh, industry business experience to the table. As I said earlier, you know, I've actually used and been part of the college system that I've integrated. I'm bringing companies to the table and building partnerships and demonstrating since I've been here, probably, you know, 75 different organizations have come in here to help them understand how they can actually use a college as a, a place in which they can actually uh, train and skill build. So I'm in the process now of several, you know, rather than building your own, um, and a lot of companies did this, they built their own training centers on site. Uh, it takes a lot of work and effort to do that and having people that can actually train when you have something like this in your backyard. And if you look around the advanced manufacturing labs that we have in here and the equipment that you see behind me, you can't just pick that up and just buy it and bolt it down. So there are different challenges nowadays uh, to for organizations to maintain competitiveness and especially with things like AI and digital and many other areas that they're getting into right now, additive manufacturing. You know, these are areas where they can come and learn about it and actually put it into practice. And then if they decide that they want to, you know, buy some of that equipment, then they're at least competent in being able to use it. So I think I bring that industry experience and bring it to the table with uh, with a different set of, uh, you know, lenses uh, than maybe a traditional dean that's grown up in the, in the academic area. And so it's not uh, either or, it's both. And, uh, and uh, just the fact that I've been around it for an awful long time and 
saw the ups and downs of organization and improving performance, I think I, I kind of bring a different set of uh, views to the table. You've touched on it, but um, maybe with reference to a particular type of client in a particular industry sector, how does the college partner with that institution? In what ways? How do they work together collaboratively? Yeah. Um, I, there's a couple ways. First of all, we got to create some awareness of what we do as an organization, right? So we, we often ask them to come to the college and just take a look at not only the equipment and the building, but meet some of the faculty, meet some of the students that can be of great value to them. We like to encourage companies to, you know, nowadays talent is so difficult. And if you're not, you know, involved in co-op or in uh, engaging students in some kind of internships, your pipeline might be scarce going forward. It's very, very competitive, especially in Ontario right now. Manufacturing is doing well and healthcare is doing well. So uh, that's an opportunity to actually uh, engage them in, you know, create some awareness. This is what we do. And then we try to demonstrate value. We show them what we can do. We talk about past experiences with other organizations. And then once they see that, we say, you know, maybe we can frame up an opportunity to engage with you and maybe test drive or try an opportunity or solve a problem. We worked with a small manufacturer here in Hamilton that had never engaged with a college or a university. They're on, on a global basis, relatively small, uh, but their parent company is rather large and uh, their margins are one cent for everything that they produce. One cent's an awful lot, but they need to get another half a cent. So we took some students, some faculty down there, we went to take a look at them, you know, helped them with some technology, uh, demonstrated to them that we can make some improvements. They showed head office in Europe, and, and before you know it, we had three or four other projects, and they got global recognition from their head office. And so those are the kinds of things. The bigger organizations kind of already get it. And then, and then we build a hypothesis around that company. I mean, how do we want to, we don't want just a one time transactional relationship. We want a long term relationship. We want to know that down the road you can come in here uh, and, and, and use this institution for many purposes. So. Now, you're part of, as you've alluded to, um, the education ecosystem. Another huge institution in this region is McMaster University. And how would you differentiate? Mohawk's positioning and role and functioning from McMaster in its vertical with respect especially to interactions with private industry? So, uh, great question. And, uh, you know, if I back up a little bit, it's not a new relationship. We've been working with McMaster for well over 20 years. We've learned how to complement each other in terms of what we do. Um, we actually have pathways into uh, different programs at the university level. So you get a diploma up to two or three years here at Mohawk College, and then you can go on and do a degree program. So our Bachelor of Technology programs are a prime example where we were one of the first college universities to do that, and a very successful program that uh, you know, almost 600 uh, engineering uh, students graduate every year at a McMaster University that have pathway from Mohawk or other colleges into that program. So it's recognized as being, a, you know, a top program. High level of practical experience is kind of the differentiator. You come here, you see the uh, multitude of labs that we have in here, and we drive that opportunity to get uh, hands-on experience in here. And and with McMaster, uh, they had a you know a different um, uh, realm of um, you know, theory and complexity that you wouldn't get at a college level. But the two are converging as, as much as even the faculties are converging. So you see business and engineering working together uh, to complement what they do in, in the workplace. And so there's so many fronts in which we can uh, work together on, even in the areas of applied research. There's things that McMaster will be doing that might be five years, very, very complex, but there's a short-term deliverable that they have. So they'll say to Mohawk, can you work on this piece of it? And we're servicing the same customers, so um, we're we're grateful that we've got that kind of a relationship. And often we hear others saying, "How do you do that? How do you make that work?" We even share faculty, and we definitely share labs and facilities, which is just nice that you can be able to do that. And I think about aerospace being a prime example of where we know that neither of us can do it alone. We have to work together, and this is so complex and so. It just works really well. We'll return to aerospace in a moment, but with respect to the, the faculty of the engineering itself, why don't you talk from a higher level about the size of the faculty, um, the breadth of its course offering, and its uh, interactions with and connections to private industry? 
So we have uh, realizing that much of our faculty faculty comes from industry, right? So they've worked in industry and they've decided to, you know, jump over and uh, go the academic route. So we have in, in the engineering area about 150 faculty um, that have worked in here part-time and full-time. And so some might have a full-time job, but they teach a particular course because of their expertise. And so that's the other unique uh, part of it is they stay relevant because they're still working in the in, in industry in some uh, capacity. Uh, but they get to teach and maybe someday they come over full time and so we've got the ability to uh, to you know have the uh, have the uh, options of uh, working with different uh, experts as we need them. I, I would imagine that having current industry experts be part of the faculty is a draw for students who are looking for relevant industry experience. Mm -hmm, for sure because they bring that back into the industry. I mean the other thing we have in here is program advisory committees. So we have industry experts sitting on every single faculty that we have at the college who advise us to make sure that we're staying uh, in the lead on our content and our curriculum. It's a requirement from the ministry to do that, but they also bring insights and they bring opportunities for students and they bring partners to the table. So that's a big part of the involvement that if you're not even part of the faculty, you can actually be part of the college in, in a different way. And so. You know, there's a few hundred of them that uh, support our um, advisory committees. How many students would the uh, would the engineering faculty graduate in a year, David? Um, I'm going to say just over a thousand students a year. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. It varies every year, and um, a significant percentage, about ten percent, is international students. So that's another big piece that we bring to the table is that we uh, we have a good rapport with the uh, international community and. Um, gives us a perspective. A lot of our uh, partners are global companies, and so it's nice to know that we can service by uh, having international students that may go back and work in, you know, an Arslamidal facility in India or some other part of the world. I take it that the college then would probably stay in touch with its alumni who are now working both nationally and globally. Big time. Alumni is very, very important to most of the educational institutions and even to the colleges now from fundraising to uh, sourcing uh, new faculty or um, hiring students um, or full-time opportunities. People are moving around all the time. Uh, we always reach out to the faculty to find out if a, if a partner comes and says they want somebody with 10 years experience. Well, then we have to go to our alumni to get that. And I take it uh, that on occasion, alumni may be coming back for additional or supplemental education from time to time? Well, that's a growing area. Both the colleges and the universities have realized that micro-credentialing is going to be huge. It's not like you take a night school course because they have a, a program in your company to pay for your, you know, uh, uh, an extra continuing education course. We're going to have to deliver uh, micro certification all the time, uh, 24 hours of the day kind of thing, and probably a lot of it online. But many of the labs in here are designed for that. So in the evening, you know, our part time um, uh, enrollment is about 16,000. It's the same as the full time enrollment. So this place is as busy after hours, after four o'clock, as it is through the day. And, uh, but that's going to be a requirement. It's moving so fast that uh, you may have graduated five years ago and now all of a sudden you need to know a little bit more about data analytics or cybersecurity or some other area in which, uh, you know, um, industry is moving into and how are you going to get that. And I think for the college and the universities, we may have to deliver that on site as well. So we have to change how we, our modality for delivering uh, training and curriculum and knowledge. Uh, it could be short courses or seminars or, um, you know, certified programs. Uh, I take it um, that the micro certification or those opportunities to obtain new skills or brush up on old ones, uh, are they offered to other industry or industry sectors for the purposes of familiarizing yourself with an area that you may not be working in full time or are they limited to those that have graduated from an engineering program? I, uh, I'm going to say both in, in that area. We also are working with like uh, companies like IBM. We have a huge partnership with IBM that uh, they have an academy of uh, a series of micro credentialing courses that they offer to uh, and we offer out to to our customers and our clients that are available to them because they can be online or they can be delivered here at Mohawk College. So that's another growing area, uh, particularly for people that travel or are far away and they think, well, geez, maybe tonight I'll do a module and they can be in their hotel room and dial in and complete a module on a particular area. So, David, let's talk a little bit about this beautiful facility, the Joyce Center. Tell me about um, 
where we are, what it does, and how it came to be. Okay, so uh, we had an opportunity to do something different at Mohawk College in terms of expanding into a new facility. We realized that um, having the Center for Climate Change here in the Burlington Hamilton area, that we wanted to be a part of that. We also recognized that climate change was important, sustainability was a big growing area, and many of our business partners and industry partners were interested in that area. And so we thought we could build just a normal building like everybody else, or we could do something different. You know, most colleges and universities have parity with each other in terms of how they offer programs. We wanted something different. And that journey isn't over yet, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this building gave an a, uh, us an opportunity to look at some of the new technologies that are uh, you know in the area of low carbon like solar and we thought geez could we actually do that and we looked into it and found a partner like canadian solar that said yeah we can put on the largest solar ray panels on top of the roof and and then we said what about geothermal and what a what a great location with the you know the uh the makeup of the geography in here being on the escarpment and the water and the rock and it was a perfect situation for geothermal and and the journey began from there so that was a piece of it the bricks and mortar where you know get that built and so this is the largest 100,000 square foot uh, geothermal solar building in canada for the most part off the grid and uh and it's been very very successful very few little problems in it very little maintenance and very little cost to run it the other part of it is what goes inside of this building that aligns with the fact that it's a sustainable building um, so the things that we have in here we have some sustainable labs we looked at energy um, we looked at digital we looked at uh, you know having an IIOT room because you know we're going to have to measure all the information that this building provides us and the journey isn't just about building the building it's about how do we inform the rest of the province Canada maybe the world on how you can actually do this and rehabilitate other buildings by the research that we do on this building and the technologies that we have learned about that can be applied to other buildings. So as we uh, redesign our, our campus plan, you know, we have old facilities. We're not going to tear down the old buildings. We're going to rehabilitate them and we're going to use the technologies that we have in here as much as possible to add those because that's the, the biggest opportunity, you know, around the world is to be able to you know, add these technologies and add a little bit of solar or geothermal or energy management systems to a building to be able to save on energy and the materials you use and the windows and the flooring and all those other things that go into that. And even the design of ventilation systems are, are hugely important and make a big difference to the building. The other part of that is when you go to Mohawk College and you graduate, um, you will know that a Mohawk College student went here because they learned about sustainability, they learned about social responsibility, they learned about energy systems, they learned about all those things that go together to make sure that you're making a difference out there. And so it'll be different for different faculties. Some will be just awareness, some will be knowledge, some will be skill building, and some will be competence in those areas. And so it's like Stanford University. If you went down to Stanford University and you bumped into a Stanford student, you know they went to Stanford University. We hope to replicate that here at Mohawk over the next 20 years that you'll know a Mohawk College student and we'll, we'll get the reputation as being the college in Ontario where you learn about low carbon and sustainability and your you know contribution because low carbon affects poverty and so many other things in, in a community that we can actually make a difference up there and so the building is important it gives us the you know the the mechanism to actually drive all these other behaviors and knowledge and and training and technology but we have to actually make sure we, we move it out to others you talked about your focus or at least i did in your in your biography in aviation aerospace and in that regard, your collaboration with the City of Hamilton Economic Development Department and McMaster University. Uh, but as we know, collaborating across institutions and industry sectors can be a challenge. Can you share with me some of your experiences and observations about the challenges of attempting to coordinate amongst all of those stakeholder institutions? Yeah, it's uh, it's been in some cases uh, we're uh, we're working hard and working you know, uh, as collaborative, collaboratively as we can, but it's not easy. If you're an organization trying to stand up um, here in Hamilton or in any, probably any community, there's a lot of pieces you have to pull together. And so there's not one single source that you can go to to get this to happen. 
And so I think uh, if there's an opportunity for um, our community here in Hamilton and other communities, even for the province and even for Canada, is to do that better than anybody else. Being able to have one kind of one-stop shopping that you can come in here and be able to pull all those pieces together, have the you know the, the hub and the nodes all lined up and that you can come in here and you can get some information. I'm helping an organization now to move from uh, another jurisdiction across the country to locate in here in Hamilton because they're manufacturing and and they want to be able to uh, you know stand up and and uh, and uh, ratchet up their operations. No no better place than in Hamilton to do that. Uh, but it requires a lot of pieces. It requires you know the educational component to it. It requires the talent. It requires the experience of other companies that have actually done this to to vertically start up a new uh, institution and all the other pieces that go with that are not easy to find when you're a small organization, even if you're a big organization. And I've done this in other jurisdictions. I've gone to Mexico to stand up, you know, automotive plants, and, and it's not easy in those places, and it's not really easy here yet, but hopefully that'll be a confidence that we bring to the table because education can, can help bring that together because of our relationships. Well, when you talk about the challenges from the perspective of, um, you know, the activity or density of an ecosystem, all those constituent parts working together, to help advance uh, as a region in a particular industry vertical, what are the advantages or assets do you think is partic that make the Hamilton area a particularly compelling value proposition for manufacturing companies? I, I, one thing is uh, because I think we're we're well connected. You know, whether I'm working with 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 Gowlings or I'm working with the city of Hamilton, we all kind of know each other, right? You bring that to the table, and I can say to a small little uh, startup company. Why don't you go down and talk to Arsenal Middle to Fasco? I know somebody there that can help you with what you're doing because they have small little satellite uh, operations. Or I can find another small company that I can say, hey, do you mind spending a couple hours and helping you know these guys learn a little bit about how you can operate and one of the challenges that you've had and share your experiences. So I think that's good because we're intimate. There are other jurisdictions that I've worked in and lived in where there isn't that intimacy. It's you know it's a one industry kind of uh, area and it's a little more difficult to be able to pick up the phone and do that. So I think that's unique about Hamilton is that we can do that in here and certainly the colleges and universities and, and others uh, have been able to build those relationships over a long time. So. That's the asset, or as, that's the asset side of the ledger. Uh, as you look at some of the specific challenges that you've experienced, can you talk a little bit about those and how you see us overcoming them in the region? Well, I think we have to be deliberate about how we're going to go about doing this. Like, I think we have to sit down and uh, look at um, you know our past experiences and say we have a lot of companies that, as you would know, outside of Hamilton that want to come here. They want to come here because we have what I would call collective competence, right? It's not just one piece, but when we put it all together, the collective competencies of our experiences, not just in manufacturing, but in innovation, in material science, all those other things when you add it up and you put it together, that really helps out. So when other companies come in here, uh, we have to be able to execute on that in a way that is... Uh, you know, in the pursuit of excellence for these companies, they can't fail. They have one opportunity to come here and be successful. And so when we put our minds to it, we have to take that collective competence and share it around the organization. And there are companies that are more than willing to put up their hand and help out and have nothing to gain by it. Uh, how do you get that in a community? That takes a lot of relationship building and understanding that, you know, for Hamilton, it's important that we're all successful. And, uh, and, you know, the other thing I, I've, I've talked to other companies in here and the fact that Hamilton's growing so much, you know, the, the talent um, wars could start happening, but that could be a good thing because people will come where jobs are and the talent could actually improve. And so they're interested in participating and that's the good thing about uh, this community. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because the recruitment of and the winning of the talent wars, um, keeping our best students in the region or attracting exceptional students who are graduates here to the region to work and to live is a huge determinant of success in an economic ecosystem. Can you tell me what your experience has been in seeing Mohawk graduates in engineering stay in the region? Uh, is this an area where we need to improve? What's been, what's been your thinking? We're, around? we're fairly fortunate. Um, in fact, it's, uh, most do stay in this region. 
I'd actually like to see, and I hope that some of our students will take the opportunity to go outside of the region just to get different experiences in that. There's a hesitation uh, a little bit because it's, you know, it's job friendly. Canadians are that way. Stay at home, you know, work in your community. But um, I think it's good. I have two daughters that are in engineering. Both of them have global opportunities after they graduate, and I'm saying go for it. And I'd like to see a little bit more effort. Having international students around helps because they're talking about their, their countries and where they're from. But the world's a big place, and I think it's a good opportunity. And they'll bring those competencies back into, into our community at some point in time. So I think it's a good thing that you know, we encourage young people to move around. But most of them actually do stay fairly close to our, our, um, our area in the you know, greater Hamilton, Toronto, Niagara, Waterloo area. Most of them right here because there's you know, plentiful um, sources of jobs around in here, so it works out quite well. In every industry vertical, um, including law, there is constant talk about innovation, disruption, um, maintaining and building innovation cultures. You've had long industry experience. You, you work collaboratively with private industry uh, in a, an educational institution that is building the future. What um, advice can you give to companies of any size, especially the smaller ones that have to get their heads around how to innovate and how to maintain an innovation culture? Yeah. So, you know, um, it's nice to put that in paper and many organizations have that as part of their either value statement or guiding principles or mission or whatever in their statements that they want to build an innovative culture. That's going to be more challenging going forward. There's less time to practice and innovate, and so you actually have to look at it very, very differently than you have in the past because time is of the essence. You've got to move very, very quickly. You've got to learn differently about those um, ideas and what others have done. And so I look at aerospace as an example. I went to a session where General Electric was giving a presentation on additive manufacturing. And the VP of engineering stood up and he said, you know, at one time we shared nothing with any other, you know, um, uh, engine manufacturer in the world, yet we're all working on the exact same piece. That doesn't need to happen anymore. There's things that we want to keep our IP on and there's other things where why are we all doing this at the same time and why don't we share? And so, you know, there are a lot of uh, organizations out there that are coming to realize that we can get there a lot faster. To be competitive, you're going to have to move a lot faster. And so we can learn on some things together and then differentiate on uniqueness in our products and how we do things. And um, so it'll be challenging and trying to build that uh, skill set and that uh, behavior in an organization to be more innovative. You know, a lot of organizations, it's people like myself, you know, 60 year olds shouldn't be designing the future of work. It's 30 year olds that should be designing the future of work and how we work together. And that's the challenge that I think a lot of leaders are having in organizations. Is how do you actually engage the younger workforce to say, this is a different way in which we can innovate and share our ideas and move things forward. So a lot more work to do on, on the softer side of how we design the future of work. So you're, as you've alluded to, you're, you're coming to the end of your career. As you look back um, and look forward, is there anything that you'd still like to accomplish that is not yet done in your mind? Boy, I don't know. I, I always say this is my soft landing in here, and, um, and I'm the poster child for how not to do it, but I think I'm the poster child for maybe how to do it, and that's where I've shifted, is that I've done a lot of things not by plan. It just happened to fall into it. You know, and I think it's good for young people to experiment. You know, this idea of job for life in one company in one location probably is not the best approach. Be willing to put your hand up. And, you know, the ugliest part of an organization, when I was in the steel industry, probably the worst place you could work is the Coke ovens. Most of the executives today came from working in the Coke ovens. If I go to the energy I'm sector... Sorry, why do you think that is? Well, because it's dirty and nobody wants to work there and it's much... No, but why is it that those folks became executives? In the because they did their time in tougher areas of the organization. So in the in the energy sector, you know, you have to go to oil sands. You're going to do your time in the oil sands, and if you don't do your time in your oil sands, you're limiting your career because there's different experience up there. It's not about getting dirty. It's the problems are different up there than they are in a 
refinery that's been operating for 50 years. And it's the same thing with the steel operation. You go into the areas, don't be afraid to put up your hand and say, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I wouldn't mind doing that. They'll remember that. And that's what they're looking for. That goes to your resume at the end of the day. You did it and you can tick that box off or go to a location that maybe not everybody wants to go to. And, uh, and it's nice to work in New York City or into London, England or into Paris, France or in downtown Toronto. But maybe Sarnia is the best place to go to to get your, you know, gain the competencies or some other location. In sharing that with me, and it's, it's very insightful, um, I'm uh, of a mind that having the capacity as an employee or a young person to take on those hard assignments necessarily requires that the person be resilient, um, be prepared to face failure, to start again, to learn from that, and that employers encourage their employees to take those chances and those risks, recognizing that they're going to fail, but encouraging them to go on nonetheless. Can you talk a little bit about that, both resilience from the employee's perspective and a tolerance for accepting failure on the part of, of, of employers or companies as being key ingredients to an innovation culture? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wish and I, I hope we can learn how to teach failure, as silly as it sounds, but you know, even to get into a college or a university, there's one industry, and that's grade point average, right? You gotta have a high grade point average, especially in engineering now, it's fairly high. Um, and I ask myself, is that the only indicator that we can come up with? Um, I think there's others. And so I won't say it's the only thing, but it's a big, it has a big weighting. And so you, you know, you come in with success and if you have a high grade point average, you go look for high marks all the time. And then you get into industry and realize you might not be as smart as you think because you haven't had those experiences, right? And so what we can do in the industry is talk about that from our experiences of what failure looks like. And you want to make sure people don't uh, get injured or hurt in areas. But I can tell you many stories, and I probably most of my learnings about when things didn't go as well as they could have, or there was an incident where something caught on fire or blew up or didn't work right, or we lost production. Those are the learnings that we have to actually recognize and and, and share with others. And you know, we, we have a term that's used in industry is lessons learned. And, and companies like uh, Arsenal, Defasco, and Suncor, uh, we always do that. At the end of a project or at the end of a startup, it's lessons learned, what could we have done differently? And so I think young people have to be prepared. There will be failure. There will be unsuccessful initiatives and projects. Don't let that be a negative. A negative. Learn how you can um, you know, move forward on that. But if you don't have any of those, you're going to be in trouble. You, you've got to have those learnings out there and uh, and use those experiences. And and hopefully there's good mentors in Oregon. Organizations have to be prepared to, you know, do the diagnostic and support uh, the development of others by talking about what could have been done differently. And, uh, but that's hard nowadays. David Santi, thank you very much for your time. Hey, thanks. Thanks for listening to the Accelerating Business Podcast, powered by Galling WLG. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, please visit GowlingWLG.com Accelerate Podcast.